Forests are valuable and important for many reasons. A forest is home to a rich variety of wild plants and animals. It is an important place for recreation, for peace, tranquility and contemplation. It also poses challenges and difficulties, and even excitement. Forests also influence climate and the water balance. The trees purify the air and produce oxygen. But apart from that, forests constitute a source of vital raw materials for mankind. The energy from the sun fuels the unceasing process of photosynthesis, which converts carbon dioxide, water and nutrients into cellulose and oxygen. On a local scale, harvesting and utilization of the raw material means jobs and a livelihood for many people in the community. While on a global scale, it means that different forest products become available to the rapidly growing populations of the world. Properly managed, our forests will provide an endless source of these valuable wood raw materials. Foresters in Sweden have to take all the facets of the forest into account. The Forestry Act specifies the minimum requirements that have to be met. The latest one from 1993 attaches equal importance to the two overriding objectives of high production and sustained biodiversity. Yet the demands made by the general public, the customers and the consumers are even higher. Recognizing this, the forestry sector has adapted its method to conservation needs, going way beyond the legal requirements. And to document its conservation work, the industry is involved in various certification schemes. So, who are the caretakers of the forests in Sweden? First and foremost, it is the 300,000 private forest owners whose average individual holding is 45 hectares of forest land. Added to these are a few thousand forestry officers, contractors, machine operators and other forest workers. Let's meet some of them now as they go about their daily work and at the same time find out how forestry operates in Sweden. Anders Nielsen's job is planning. This forest is 100 years old and ready for final felling. Anders is drawing up a detailed plan of how the new stand is to be established and which areas have a special conservation value on this site. This information will be used in deciding how the harvesting will be done. Anders is also collecting data on the trees such as their species, volume and quality. To help him in his work, he has a GPS receiver, which is linked to a field computer, which displays maps and relevant details of the area. Back at the office, he downloads the day's results into the company's databases. When it's time for felling, Orke Larsson arrives in his harvester to start work, which he'll do in accordance with the plan that Anders has already drawn up. But he does his own detailed planning, deciding the course that the operating strips will take in consideration of the terrain and stand conditions, and the machine's capabilities, also bearing in mind the subsequent extraction work. Felling is fairly straightforward. The sharp saw chain quickly cuts through the stem without creating splits in the valuable butt log. Limbing and bucking are done in a single operation. The diameter and length of the stem are measured and a computer calculates how the stem should be bucked to achieve the maximum value. Orca can accept the computer's recommendation or override it. For example, if he notices damage to the stem that the computer is unable to take into account. 
the computer records details of all the timber harvested, and at the end of his shift, Orca gives the office details of the total output for the day, usually about 200 cubic meters. This information is then used in transport planning and by the mills. If the price of a given assortment changes, the new price is entered into the computer. In this way, the harvester can quickly and easily adapt its output to the customer's requirements. A few days later, Pele Johansson arrives in his forwarder to extract the timber. Using the grapple loader, he loads the different assortments onto the machine and drives them out to the forest truck road. Thanks to its eight driven wheels mounted in bogies, the forwarder has excellent mobility. If necessary, Pele can reduce the ground pressure further by fitting tracks onto the wheels, but it's still important to avoid marshy ground, unless it's frozen, of course. At the truck road, he piles the timber in large stacks, each of which contains a single assortment. When the nutrient status of the site allows it, the tops and branches can be exploited for use as bioenergy fuel. Arne Halberg collects the logging residue on his forwarder and deposits it in large piles. The piles are later reduced to wood chips which are used to fuel large heating stations. This is what it can look like after final felling. Marshy areas have been left undisturbed. A number of wind-firm trees, often hardwoods, have been retained so that the new stand will contain some old trees as well. and here and there the harvester has left tall stubs, all for the purpose of safeguarding biodiversity. <laughs> After final felling, regeneration of the site needs to be assured. On dry soils, it's easy for natural regeneration to occur. A number of trees are left to drop seeds onto the ground so that enough new seedlings will grow. If there's a thick layer of vegetation on the ground, natural regeneration can still take place if the mineral soil is first exposed by scarification. Jan Jonsson operates a scarifier and adapts the intensity of the scarification to the varying conditions on the site. Again, all in accordance with the original plan. But on the majority of forest land in Sweden, acceptable natural regeneration isn't possible. Here the new stand has to be established by planting. Eva Svensson plants seedlings, setting out some 2,000 a day. Each seedling has to be planted carefully to ensure that it'll survive and grow well. Altogether, about 300 million seedlings are planted in Sweden every year. The seedlings are raised under carefully controlled conditions in large nurseries. Most of the seed comes from specially selected mother trees in seed orchards. Which means that seedlings can be chosen that have the right quality and hardiness characteristics for the specific site. Because the extensive planting operation has to be completed in a fairly short season, the large enterprises use machinery for this job as well. Developing planting machines capable of working around the stumps, roots, stones and slash has been a long and hard process. But now we have machines that can do the job. Björn Ramberg operates a machine that scarifies the soil and plants seedlings in one operation. It plants about 450 seedlings an hour. 
If the job is done properly, these seedlings will grow just as well as those planted by hand. After about 10 years, it's time for the first job of tending the new stand. Magnus Eckengren is a forest owner who does his own cleaning or pre-commercial thinning. He decides which trees he wants to retain in the new stand and removes the rest using a brush saw. He selects trees on the basis of species and quality, as in all the work he does, he has to strike a balance between production and conservation objectives. The felled trees are left on the ground to rot away naturally. The trees that are left will continue to grow, and in order to obtain a stand with the desired quality and tree dimensions, it'll have to be thinned two or three times or so before final felling. This forest owner, Hans Hurtig, also chooses to do the job himself and arrives at the site complete with chainsaw and the necessary safety equipment. The trees are felled with precision so that they fall towards the strip road and land at a comfortable height for linding. But an increasing volume of thinning work is also now mechanized. Dick Passon operates a harvester in thinnings. He starts by opening up strip roads spaced 15 to 20 meters apart removing trees between the roads as well. From his seat in the cab, he selects which trees are to be harvested and processes them in exactly the same way as in final felling. In thinning, it's very important to avoid damaging the residual trees as damage can greatly reduce the value of the timber. Thinning in the summer also entails a high risk of root rot fungus infecting the fresh stumps and spreading through the roots to the residual trees. To prevent this happening, the open surface on the stumps is sprayed with the spores of a competing fungus in conjunction with felling. Here again, a forwarder follows close on the heels of the harvester. This machine is a smaller and more nimble one than before and less likely to damage the residual trees. Apart from that, the wide tires reduce the pressure on the ground, reducing the risk of damage to the tree roots. The timber can't be left for too long on the roadside. The mills want fresh wood, not wood infected with insect pests or damaging fungi. Arne Vestlin loads his 24 meter long haulage rig with 40 tons of timber and winds his way carefully along the narrow forest road. Nowadays, all timber leaves the forest by road. It's usually delivered straight to the mill, but if the mill is a long way away, the load is transferred onto a goods train at a special terminal. Advanced transport management systems, which include the planning of return loads, are used to improve the efficiency of the haulage operations. Both the public and private sector organizations in forestry have opted for extensive decentralization which means not only that considerable responsibility now lies with the forest owners, contractors and employees, but also that a higher level of expertise is required. Youngsters interested in forestry can take a three-year course at upper secondary school, where in addition to general subjects, they're also taught skills relevant to a future as a forest owner or forest worker. A number of academic courses are open to those aspiring to a career in forestry. Forestry employees are kept abreast of developments through regular refresher courses. Tens of thousands of forest owners every year participate in study circles focusing on topical issues. 
Here, for instance, they learn all about ecological forestry through the Greener Forests Training Package. Forest owners can also receive advice on the management of their own lands from their local forestry board or forestry cooperative. There's no doubt that the successful development of Swedish forestry is largely attributable to the skills and commitment of the people who are working in it. But how do we monitor the level of success in attaining the objectives of high production and sustained biodiversity, and that the raw materials used for paper and board have been produced in a way that's acceptable to the consumer? The status of the country's forests is monitored continually through the National Forest Survey. Of course, there's always room for improvement, but the overall verdict is that the forestry sector is doing a good job. All the industrial forest enterprises and forestry cooperatives have some environmental certification scheme, be it under the International Standards Organization, the Forest Stewardship Council, or the Pan-European Forest Certification Scheme. Independent institutes inspect the activities and issue certificates to companies that meet the criteria. Such a certificate is an assurance to customers that the forestry activities are being pursued in accordance with the principles laid down by the respective certification body. Swedish forestry is therefore well equipped to meet the challenges of the next century. We are ready both to maintain the biodiversity of our forests and to meet the growing demand for forest products. For timber, paper, fabrics, methanol, pharmaceuticals, or any products yet to be created.